There she is. She's hey, Stephanie, it's Gail and Steve. Oh, yay. Hi. Hi. Hi, how are you? Hi. great. How are you? Good. Good. We're, we're surviving. Yep. <laughs> You've been helping us survive. Wonderful. Thank you oh, it's much. so nice to see all these familiar faces. Hi, Sharon. Hi, how are you? Can you hear me? This is great. We have um, almost 40 people sign up for the talk. So I'm just going to give it a few minutes and let people <laughs> come on in. Let's see. Can you hear me, Stephanie? Both of course, and as you deployed those safely, he landed in Kazakhstan and was helped out uh, the capsule by some of the other Russian colleagues, cosmonauts, and other NASA staff. And we're all glad to see him back and gave us kind of a nice thumbs up that he made it back okay. Because usually once once I share my screen, I'm not able to see who is in the waiting room. So I'll just give it a few minutes and then we'll get started. We have 18 people so far. I don't know. Can you hear me? Sharon, it's so nice to see your face. You too. <laughs> Can you hear me? You can't hear me. I can't hear you. You are muted. Oh, okay. Let me look. Over. Um, usually the lower left of the screen, there should be a little mute button near the video. There button. is. And when I hit it, it says mute my audio. Can you hear me? Because I, I don't want to mute my audio. We, we can hear, hear you, me. Sharon. Oh, no. I'm sorry. I can't hear you. No, I can't. Oh. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave and come back in. I'm gonna... <laughs> I can see. <laughs> I okay, don't know. See, we have 19. <clears throat> excuse me, 19 people. Okay. Um, while we're waiting, I just helped someone take a mouse nest out from under their sink, and we <laughs> successfully were able to get the mom and all the babies. It's been like almost a full day ordeal where I put a camera on them and we successfully got everyone. So now, aside from the baby mice that I'm taking care of, I have a family of mice in my apartment <laughs> and I have a camera on them to make sure that the mother nurses the pups. Oh my. Because oh I do my. not want to be their mother. So <laughs> super hopeful. <laughs> That's good. I want to leave here. Oh. oh, interesting. It says Ariane says she can hear Sharon, so Sharon is not muted. Interesting. I'm not sure why that is. Thank you for letting me know. I cannot hear. My sound is on. Huh. Well, hopefully everyone can hear me. I think you can. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. She's back. Okay. We have 21 people on, so I will go ahead and I will get started. So my name is Stephanie Ellis and I'm the executive director of Wild Care. I'm so excited that you are joining me this evening for a trip to the Galapagos. And what I'm going to do is show you um, a, a day in the life on the boat with Lindblad and National Geographic in 2019 when I was able to go with them uh, to visit the Galapagos. It was a life-changing trip and I'm excited to go back again this October. And so I'm going to share my screen see. Make sure you all can see this. Okay. If someone can give me a thumbs up that you can hear me and you can see the screen. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I visited Galapagos in 2019 with Lindblad and National Geographic, and I'm excited to say that I'm going back this year in October and I'm actually taking people with me. It's a wild care fundraiser. I'm very excited and there is room on this trip if you'd like to attend. And so at the end of the talk, um, if you wish to stay on, I have Nancy Bradford 
and she is our travel specialist who booked this. Um, she arranged this trip for us, and so she's going to uh, be on and answering any questions you might have and give a really quick presentation. So that will be at the end of my talk. And okay, I am going to, I just want to make sure I don't miss anyone. I think I've got everyone. Okay, excellent. So the Galapagos, um, when I went to Galapagos, this was my home for seven days on the water. This is the National Geographic ship, it's the Endeavor 2. Um, and it was very comforting to have the boat around us wherever we were. We could always see it in the distance. Um, so the Galapagos Islands, where are they located? Well, they're located about 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador. Um, and how we got there was we flew from Guayaquil, which is a very large uh, city in Ecuador, and we flew from Guayaquil to San Cristobal. And that was a, a quick flight. And then we were greeted by um, National Geographic staff and we went out to the boat. And so a little bit more about the Galapagos Islands. Um, they are, um, it's an archipelago and it represents over 17,000 square miles of ocean and land. So it's expansive. And uh, the reason that it's so critically important is because it's home to over 2000 species of plants and animals that only live there. You've all heard of the Darwin finches, several different um, species of finches that inspired Darwin's theory of evolution in 1835. Um, but also it's the only penguins that you can find in the Northern hemisphere. And I will explain why in the next slide. Um, so the Galapagos Island chain was made into a national park in 1959, and it is um, managed by the Ecuadorian government, and they take very good care of it. Uh, they limit uh, the number of people who are on any of the given islands at any time. You can only go to most of the islands with a controlled, uh, with a group, um, and they like to keep the islands as untouched as possible. So the islands straddle the equator, and so you are very close to the sun when you're out there. Oops, so I can just remind everyone to please mute yourself. It's coming from my phone. It's fine. Oh, come there's no volume from there. Because I don't know if I can mute any. Am I muted? Sorry, everyone. There you go. <laughs> okay, just muted you. Sorry about that. So um, it's a very um, temperate climate. And so the, it's usually a temperature, you know, in the 70s or 80s throughout the year. And there are five ocean currents that converge here, which is why it is the northernmost place that penguins can actually survive. That's because of um, the chilly Antarctic current that goes through the Galapagos Islands. Um, it is a National Marine Reserve and a UNESCO heritage site, very important place for plants and animals and the native peoples who live there. So, um, so we flew from Guayaquil to San Cristobal and then we were greeted by National Geographic crew and we got onto the Zodiac and we boated out to uh, the mothership which was our home for seven days. San Cristobal is one of four inhabited islands in Galapagos and has the second largest population of about 6,000 people. So we went out to the boat. I can, words cannot express my excitement. I had no idea <laughs> what to expect for the next seven days. And so here you see we embark the ship from the Zodiac. And so after we got settled in, uh, safety drills, you see your room, take a rest. Um, they actually had us go to one site that afternoon. We disembarked and we were able to spend some time in, um, it's called the Puerto Bacareso Moreno and uh, it's a port. It's also the capital of Galapagos on San Cristobal. And this was my first introduction to the friendly wildlife or the approachable wildlife of Galapagos. I'm sure you guys all, when you think of the Galapagos, you think of animals everywhere that you can get really close to. And that is absolutely true. It's probably the closest you can get to wildlife and without disturbing them, mind you, um, 
you can't find this anywhere else on the planet. So we get to this port and there are sea lions just laying around. It's the largest Galapagos sea lion colony um, in this area for all of Galapagos. And so um, blue, blue waters, I saw sea turtles swimming by and I got to see nurseries of sea lion pups. And I hope that you guys like sea lions because there are a lot of sea lion photos in this presentation. They were just all around us and creches or nurseries of pups um, this pup is with its mother, um, but a lot of times the pups would be all together, you know, in groups and there's safety in numbers and they're waiting for their mom to come home in the evening to nurse them. This pup looked like it probably just nursed. This was getting close to dusk and then he was having a siesta. Uh, so then we went back to the boat and have dinner and get super excited about what the next day holds. So the next day, we went to Española. Um, and something that you should know is uh, what we did was the, the Endeavor, the, the large ship, that traveled at night only. So most of the time I didn't even realize we were moving. And then in the morning you wake up and you're in a new location outside of a different island. So that was great um, and exciting. You never know where you're going to wake up. And so this morning uh, we woke up and we were outside of Española. And so Oops. In the morning, um, we saw Gardner Bay, which was absolutely beautiful. It was white sand, blue water, sea lions everywhere. Oops, my mouse is very slippery. Sea lions everywhere. This was an Española mockingbird, which is an endemic species uh, to Galapagos and to that island. And so I was absolutely thrilled to be there. As I mentioned, our boat is always off in the distance. And so there was, um, it was very comforting to see the boat always, um, no matter what you were doing. These were the zodiacs that we traveled to and from the boat uh, to the islands. And here's just another glimpse of what it looked like in Gardner Bay. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, and the water that day, I can't remember the temperature, it might've been 65 degrees. This was in early December. And 65 degrees to me or to us as Cape Codders, that's nothing, right? We got this. So I was the only one in the water uh, at first and then someone else got in. And I'm thrilled that I went in because this sea lion, this was my first real close interaction where this sea lion was going back and forth on the beach. It was barking and he was basically telling other males to stay away from his harem. And I was not a part of his harem. He did not even pay attention to me, um, but swam by me back and forth several times. It was just, you can see on my face, I was absolutely thrilled. That was a great experience. When you think about Galapagos, you can't think about uh, the islands without thinking about these beautiful crabs. So the Sally Lightfoot crabs were on all of, I think all of the islands that we visited and they are beautiful and also very approachable and very photogenic, as you can see here. And you will see, I'm going to play this little video, and you will see a couple of Española mockingbirds moving off to the right, and you'll also see crabs scurrying off to the right. See all the crabs? They're just everywhere. Um, and the, it's, the islands are volcanic. They've formed over millions of years. There are still active volcanoes in part of the archipelago. And you can see here all this um, larva rock. Very beautiful and unique landscape. Um, more sea lions and their moms, just absolutely beautiful creatures, especially at dusk when you can witness the reunions of the pups um, with their mother when their mother returns from sea. Actually, I have a video of that. And then, um, so usually with National Geographic and Lindblad, they pack the, the schedule. There's so much to do. And of course, you don't have to do everything, but it's like, how could you not? You, you want to do everything. So in the morning, there was always a trip. And then in the afternoon, there would be a trip. And always of varying intensity. You can do short walks or long walks. Um, and so they had really a little bit for everyone. And so in the afternoon, we visited another part of Española and I was able to see 
An another nursery of sea lion pups. And you can see here, these pups, they're by themselves. They look vulnerable, but they don't have a lot of land predators. See all the animals in the water playing? Those are young sea lion pups. They're waiting for their mom and they're learning how to, to play, how to swim, how to hunt in this shallow area, which is free of hammerhead sharks. Um, and they sort of figure out life and expend a lot of energy throughout the day until their mom comes back. Loved these guys, absolutely beautiful. Uh, this is a marine iguana. And this was my first introduction to marine iguanas. This is the only marine lizard on the planet. So if you want to see a marine lizard, you have to go to the Galapagos. And they were incredible. It is like something right out of Jurassic Park. And our guide, Salvador, he said, don't step on the iguanas, don't step on their tails. And I thought like, what is he talking about? You know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be near them. Well, we were definitely near them. In fact, we had to clear this path so we could walk through because the iguanas are just everywhere laying about soaking up the sun. Gorgeous creatures, really fascinating. Look at this beautiful animal. So this was early December. It is the drought season for Galapagos. And in one month from then, uh, from then everything would be lush and green. Um, but even so, these animals were coming into their breeding condition and they take on these splendid colors. So this is a male uh, marine iguana in his prime. And they do sit around blowing salt out of their nose, just like you see on the movies. <laughs> they really, really do that. Another treat on the island of Española was the waved albatross. This is the only island that they nest on in the Galapagos chain. And we were there just in time to be able to see birds, not only on eggs, but also with chicks. And words cannot express. Um, so this is from, this photo is from a photographer, uh, a good photographer. These photos are from my iPhone, if you can imagine. So that is how close you are to these animals. Um, they seem relatively unscathed. The guides always tell you, you must stay at least um, six feet away from these animals at all times. This bird was sitting on an egg. And I don't know if you can see this fluffy little thing. That is an albatross chick. So that was incredible. More sea lion pups, can't get enough of them. A bird that I really wanted to see, and I saw many of them, was the Nazca boobies. And Nazca, the, they got their name because of um, the tectonic plates that make up the, the Galapagos. They are called Nazca plates. And so that's where they get their name. You can see they're a strikingly beautiful bird. Here they are nesting everywhere. If you can see it amongst all the poop, all the whitewash. Um, and they're quite comical. They're related to the boobies and related uh, to our Northern Gannet, which is also a booby of the North Atlantic. And so I just see this and what is not to love. It's an extraordinary looking bird. And so we were able to have many close encounters with these beauties. This was the landscape on Española. And again, drought season, volcanic. There was also some beautiful color, which reminded me of foliage in New England in the fall. And I took this picture because you can see here, it looks like this vast Jurassic Park landscape. It looks like it would be void of any life and it's teeming with life. In fact, there's an albatross head right there that was an albatross uh, sitting on either a chick or an egg, I can't remember. And iguanas everywhere. And I have to tell you that this sea lion was the only sea lion on the whole trip that ex expressed dismay at us being there. Um, this animal, when our group was walking through, and it's a small group of no more than 12 people at a time, when we were walking through, he actually charged us. Um, half-heartedly, but our guide actually laughed because he, you don't usually see aggressive displays, but he wanted us to stay away from his harem. Um, and look at that face. How can you resist? <laughs> They're just beautiful, ridiculous creatures. So on this island, 
I am so sorry. I think I have the slipperiest mouse, computer mouse ever. It just keeps moving. I barely touch it. So this was, I actually was able to record on my phone a reunion of a mother returning from sea at dusk and her pup greeting her. And I'm going to be quiet so that you can hear what it sounds like. It's a very joyous occasion. <coughs> Oops. <laughs> Why? <laughs> That's another pup waiting for its mother. This was not his mother. Um, it was pretty incredible to see. I just got goosebumps. It's hard to not be anthropomorphic when you witness these behaviors that are so human-like. There's truly, there's a bond, there's excitement that they see each other once again, and then the kid just wants to start nursing. <laughs> it's like being a real mom, right? A human mom. These are a bunch of Nazca boobies uh, settling in for the night. And I was sad to leave Española. I think that was probably my favorite, most favorite excursion. It was a remarkable place. So the next day we had an option for early birds that we could have a 6 a.m. disembarkation to go to the island of Floriana. I am not an early bird, but on this trip I became an early bird because I didn't want to miss anything. And I'm glad that I did become an early bird because um, this is what I woke up to. This is the back of our boat. Our Zodiac drivers are ready to take us out to the next adventure. This was my dear friend Elizabeth, who took me on this trip um, and she was excited. She is an early bird. And here's where we went. Okay, so let me see if I back up my mouse. So I showed you we were just on Española and now we went to Floriana. So we were visiting um, the southeastern islands. I didn't visit any of the western islands during this trip. And so when we got to Floriana, this is what it looked like. Um, it's some um, volcanic structures uh, and we saw flamingos, which honestly I didn't expect. I had all these you know, birds that I was hoping to see and I didn't even think about flamingos. And we saw lots of flamingos. And look at the landscape, clay in the sediment. Um, again, it was drought, but still beautiful with some green vegetation. And we were able I have a couple of close-up pictures from someone on the trip. We were able to see young flamingos being fed. So that was pretty incredible. This is an adult here on the left. This is what the landscape looked like. Um, a sea turtle had just nested here. It was a pretty spectacular place. And it was the one day where I think it may have drizzled slightly. All the other days, you know, it's 70, 80 degrees, really very agreeable, lovely weather. When I stepped into the water here, there were about 10 or 12 stingrays in the water swimming around. And this was just our guide um, for that particular excursion, talking about different bones and sea urchins, et cetera, et cetera. And this is where I saw my first blue-footed booby, except this booby did not have blue feet because this is an immature bird and they don't have their blue feet until they're in their adult plumage. I'll, I'll show you some pictures of adults shortly later. And I just have to share, so we went back to the boat and then there's a midday excursion and I decided that I wanted to go on a Zodiac excursion. And I'm really glad that I did um, because we saw some different topography and some different animals. Um, and something really fascinating happened. So we were on the Zodiac and we were going into this islet um, and it looked like this. There's cactuses, you know, you can see the volcanic rock, there's sleeping sea lions. And then we saw a couple of frigate birds who were overhead. They're large birds, um, they look, they're very pirate-like and they are related to cormorants and pelicans. Um, and uh, the boobies, 
and they were twirling and twirling and twirling and like dropping something and picking it up and dropping it. And it was almost like a courtship dance. And unfortunately what they were doing was they had a chick from a gull uh, that they were going to eat. Um, and then what happened ne next was absolutely amazing. And I apologize for the graphic image, but they dropped the chick onto me in the boat. And like everyone freaked out in the boat, the, the Zodiac driver, our, our guide, I mean, they just couldn't believe it. And the chick, unfortunately, it was, it was pretty much gone by the time it, they had dropped it into my lap. And so I threw it to the birds and it was just, you know, I don't want to see anything die. I'm in the field of making things live, um, but it was a natural event. And the birds being so close to us like that was a pretty incredible experience that I won't ever forget. Magnificent birds. Okay, so my first underwater experience with sea lions, this was incredible. Um, sea lions in Galapagos are very curious. They want to, to interact with you. They try to interact with you. And so I got some underwater footage with the GoPro of uh, my first up close sea lion experience in the water. And you'll see that this animal comes right up to my face. It's so funny. <laughs> you can see the scars on its back. I have to say, you know, when that, when that happens, I mean, here you're so used to, um, we stay away from animals for one um, and give them their space, but also animals around us are not approachable. So at first I was like, ah, you know, ah, like this huge animal coming right at me. Um, and then I learned to just relax and they're just checking me out. And I think I have another, do I have another sea lion? Oh, I think I skipped one. I have to go back. Is it this or did I miss one? No, did I just show you this one? This one. Oh yeah, that, I love that. So he basically, he swam and then he sort of went upside down as if to get a better look, just get a better look at me. Like, what are you? So funny, so curious. So that was just extraordinary. I, you couldn't get me out of the water. I wanted to snorkel every day. This was, uh, and I did snorkel every day. This was deep water snorkeling. And they also had bay snorkeling for people who may not want to be in a water column that is that deep. Either way, both opportunities were extremely safe. You always have a guide in the water with you. You always have a partner and you have your Zodiac driver always looking out for you. I want to show you what it looks like uh, when you're snorkeling, what it looks like above the water and below the water. So you can see sleepy sea lions. And then you go below and there's just fish everywhere. It's absolutely incredible. So I think this shows you why I did not want to get out of the water. <laughs> And then when we would uh, get back on the boat, you had to always make sure there's this board at the back of the boat, which shows your room number. I was 320. And you have to move the pin to show that you are now um, aboard and that you're not off board. But my roommate would often forget to move the peg. And then at dinner, um, National Geographic would call out the names of the people who were lost at sea. <laughs> and so I didn't, we didn't want to be publicly shamed. So every time I'd get on the boat, I would just move the peg so that to show that my roommate was on board, even though I didn't know where she was. <laughs> I was pretty sure she was fine. Really, really fun. Okay. So um, this next day, we went to Santa Cruz. And Santa Cruz has the largest uh, population of people on the four inhabited islands. I think there's a population of around 11,000 people. And this was the one day where we were dry docked, where we actually docked and we spent the day on, on land and on foot all day. 
And what we did was we went to the Darwin Research Institute, which is an extraordinary place uh, for many years now, I think since the 70s, they have been uh, basically doing a captive breeding program to repopulate uh, the Galapagos tortoises back into the wild. So you can see here there were 1,286 tortoises at this facility when I was there. And I love this sign. This is the best sign. It says it all. Uh, basically, tortoises and iguanas this way. My favorite of the whole trip. So this was a really special tortoise who I met um, who's no longer there. His name was Diego. And the reason that he was so special is you probably heard about this tortoise last year in the news that this tortoise on his own had so much sex that he saved his entire species. Um, this animal had basically been taken out of the wild, I think in 1935. Um, and <clears throat> he was put into a zoo for many years, the San Diego Zoo. And then in, I can't remember the timeline. I might have written it down. Might actually have been the 50s that it went, he went to the Darwin Research Center and has been there since then siring offspring um, of Galapagos tortoises. And so Diego alone, he fathered 800 offspring and populated over 40% of the island of Española. And the reason I'm so honored I met him is because just last year they announced he finally, after being in captivity since I think it was 1935, spending almost 100 years of his life in captivity, he was finally released back to Española. So this turtle now lives wild. And there were a few other tortoises at the facility who were also released. Um, and so what happened was um, whalers had found the Galapagos Islands in the 1600s. And they learned that tortoises can actually survive for several months without food or water and literally provide a meal, a living meal on a shell. Uh, very inhumane. They would stack them sometimes 200 high in the boats and then go out to sea with these tortoises and eat them. Um, there were a lot of other things that happened. I'll talk about it at the very end. Um, things that contributed to the massive decline of these tortoises. Here are some little baby tortoises that I saw that would be eventually released back into the wild. And here is, this was at the Darwin Institute. It was not a wild animal. Um, I did see land iguanas in the wild, but my photos were, are not nearly as good. So I'm showing you what they look like now. So this is not a marine iguana, but it's a land iguana, which lives on some of the islands in Galapagos. And an incredible highlight of Santa Cruz that you cannot miss is um, Puerto Ayora. And at this port, there is a fish market. This is the fish market. It's very small. It's one table, two people. And the wildlife there was incredible. I could have stayed there all day looking at the animals that were basically begging for handouts. This grape, this is a great blue heron. This is a really sassy, sassy pants sea lion. She had an attitude. You can tell just by looking at her face. I loved her. Look at her looking at the fish. And they do get handouts at the end of the day, which is why they are hanging out there, basically. This is a lava gull. What an extraordinary bird, aptly named for living on these volcanic islands. And definitely a parasite, um, you know, just grabbing food wherever they can, just like a gull. And I saw this bird get into a bag of someone's bread that they had set down for like two minutes. And he was in it. I was like, gulls are the same everywhere you go. <laughs> you can't change them. This is just a view of the beautiful port, the Sally Lightfoot crabs, the blue green water. Miss Sassy Pants, I thought she was going to take his cell phone out of his pocket. She was so close. They actually would use, they used fly swatters, you know, to, to get the sea lions to back away from the table. And sometimes they would step over the sea lions. I was just blown away. I had not... I've never witnessed anything like that. 
And most of my photos are landscapes and animals, but also uh, Santa Cruz was very beautiful, very colorful town, beautiful people, and um, so much cultural history there. Uh, it was really lovely. I wish we had more time there. These are the native spiny lobsters. And then uh, we saw Galapagos tortoises in the wild. And in the wild for them on Santa Cruz is, it's actually a preserve, um, but it's acres and acres of land where they can roam free and forage and people can come and visit them. So this is where I saw, excuse me, my first, Galap my first wild Galapagos tortoises. Um, the size of these animals is unimaginable. I mean, hundreds of pounds and many of them over a hundred years old. And it, you can go right near them and they don't even flinch. It's like you're not there. And I love this sign, don't touch the tortoises. I can see how it'd be very tempting because they just eat and eat and eat. Here's an example of, you know, how close we are to these animals and they are relatively unfazed. These are tortoises in a primordial soup, keeping cool, even though it was a cool day. Just beautiful, beautiful. And notice, so I told you that it was drought season in Galapagos early December, but every island is different. Each island has a unique climate and um, <coughs> different parts of the islands have unique climates. So, you know, this side of Santa Cruz was extremely lush, while another side of Santa Cruz showed more um, drought-like conditions. You can't take a picture of these massive beasts without taking pictures of their massive poop. So this is their poop, which is like almost the size of my foot. <laughs> Couldn't resist. Uh, and then we were back to the boat and I was sad to leave that special place, but I was also very excited to, to be on the boat after a long, wonderful day. So the next day, it looks like in the morning, we went to some locations called Dragon Hill, Guy Fox, L. Eden and Daphne Major. And those are uh, here. And we did a walk and you can see again, very bulk volcanic looking uh, topography, black oh. built, oops. <laughs> um, here is a land iguana and look at this landscape. I had to take a picture of this because this was the one place where it really felt like drought, drought-like conditions. And these iguanas, they basically, they spend months of the drought sitting under cactuses. I'm so sorry, everyone. Sitting under cactuses and waiting for the fruits to drop because that is their only food to eat. And I thought, what a life. You know, it was, I think it was in the low 80s, the warmest day. And so you felt you could really feel those drought like conditions. And I thought, what a lifestyle for these animals to just sit under cactuses for months waiting for fruit to drop. And our guide told us at that time, they are not territorial. They are not thinking about breeding. They are thinking about survival. This was a good year, but our guides said in some years, you know, on this island, you can go through and the animals show signs of fatigue of, and of starvation. So I was happy that they obviously had had a good season um, prior to the drought and they were doing okay. Very pretty landscape. And here's some adult blue-footed boobies, you guys. Love these guys. So now you can see the blue bill, the blue feet, uh, related to the other boobies and related to our northern gannet. Love this photo. It's just classic, timeless looking, isn't it? I expect, you know, pterodactyls to be in the background. This is a young blue-footed booby. And these are uh, Galapagos um, shearwaters. And in the evenings, you know, after several trips, walks and snorkeling and lunch and a talk, and then often afterward, we, we would have um, cervezas or captain's cocktails on the upper deck. That is the best way to celebrate the end of the day. Uh, and also sometimes they would offer stargazing in the evening on the top deck. 
so this is what it would look like um, on the top deck after a wonderful day. I miss that so much and I can't wait to get back. Okay, so now is for the highlight of my trip. This was the best, <laughs> the best experience I've, I think I've ever had in my life. Okay. So I told you that the Galapagos penguins, they are the only penguins in the Northern Hemisphere and they are able to be there because of that humble Ar um, Antarctic current that goes through the Galapagos chain. And even so, it's still pretty warm for them and their population is small. So our guides told us there's only about two to 3,000 Galapagos penguins uh, remaining. And so if we were to see like one or two or three, that's a big, big sighting. That's a big day. So this was going to be our chance. We we're going to Bartolome and um, Bartolome. Oh, here it is right here. So you can see we went to, um, we were Santa Cruz and then we moved up here. We get ready. I am ready to see penguins. Um, my scalp was burning because when you're at the equator, you are extremely close to the sun. And so I bought this blue footed booby scarf to put on my head. And I thought it was the stupidest thing, but then everyone was like, where did you get that? It's my favorite souvenir. Um, the ship has an awesome gift shop. They have all the toiletries and medications that you would need, but then they also have a gift shop. So that's my favorite souvenir to myself. So we're ready to see penguins. We are ready. This is Sombrero Chino. It's shaped like a Chinese hat is that what they say and that's why they call it that. Okay, this rock is so meaningful to me. So we first, we saw some uh, penguins in the distance and one of my friends on the boat took this photo. They're very small penguin, very beautiful. We saw a couple of little heads while we were coming in on our Zodiac. And then what happened next seriously changed my life. And this is why I'm going back. I was snorkeling and my partner said, my head was under and my partner was like, Stephanie. And then I looked up and he said, the penguins are coming right at you. And so I thank God I had like my wits about me. I went under the water with my GoPro camera. And this is what I saw. That's me laughing at the end. I slowed down the video. I have to play that again so you can see, watch all the little penguin heads. So their head went down, my head went down, and then I was able to capture it. It was nine penguins. I mean, I could have touched them. You can see the air bubbles coming off their back. I didn't touch them and I didn't even think about it because I just want to be, I'm in their habitat and I wanted to be respectful. I don't need to touch things, but I am glad that I videoed, <laughs> that I took a video of them. So that was just incredible. It's like, how do you, how can you top that? And then I was late going back to the Zodiac. I was one of those people because on my way back from the penguins, totally exhilarated, I saw this. I couldn't believe it. So this is a white tip reef shark. And I was just swimming over him. He paid no attention to me. They don't have negative shark interactions there. Um, and these are just peaceful animals and they mind their own business. You can see the white tip to the tail and the white tip to this dorsal fin. So I had to get video of this shark and then I was late to the boat. Oh my God, I've never swam so fast in my entire life to get back to the boat. So that was cool. <laughs> okay, and then this is the last day of the trip. So we were going to Genovisa, which is nicknamed Bird Island, and you'll see why in just a minute, but um, there are these stairs there called Prince Philip Step that you climb up and you're basically on top of this, you're on top of this flattened volcano, essentially, and there's so much life up there. And so this was our guide for the day, his name was um, Christian. And he said, this is the frosting on the cake, you guys. And I was thinking, how could it be? Because well, how could it be any better than what we've already seen? And he was right. 
Um, we got to the top of that flattened volcano. It was drought-like conditions you'll see, and it was parents and chicks everywhere. It is the largest blue, uh, excuse me, red-footed booby colony on the planet, over 40,000 red-footed boobies. There were probably tens of thousands of these Nazca boobies feeding their chicks. So this is what it looked like. We walked through, there's, you know, booby here, booby here, frigate bird here, boobies, all kinds of stuff going on. And you walk through and you see these birds. This bird was just chilling, incubating her egg. Oops, I also love the footprints. Um, the birds in the booby family, they have uh, these beautiful, it's called a toe to palmate foot. Like if you look at a duck, they normally have three toes that are webbed and then the hind toe is not. In this pelican, booby, cormorant family, um, all four toes are webbed. And that is so they can incubate the egg on their feet. They have these warm, vascular, beautiful feet. See how the egg is on top? But also it creates these remarkable patterns in the dirt, in the sand. And so I just had to take a picture. So this is an example of how close we're getting. You can see mom doesn't give two cares about us being there. Neither does the chick. Uh, this is beautiful also. They, it looked like mandala um, patterns, the, the poop that these birds make around their nests. So these are all nesting birds. Here's a little video. This day was, actually this might have been the hottest day and it was like 82 or 85 at the most. So you can see the baby, he's sitting back on his hawks and he's, um, he's gular fluttering, fluttering the chin. And this is what birds do. Birds don't have sweat glands. So this is the equivalent of say a dog panting. So through evaporative cooling with his mouth open and his um, chin movements, he is actually cooling himself off. The parent didn't care we were there. So these birds, I, I adore them. They had a whimsical, ridiculous call, which matches how ridiculous they look. So I'm gonna be quiet again and I'm gonna let you listen to what these birds sound like. <laughs> so, I don't know if you could hear that kind of comical. It sounds like when I was a child, they had straws that would make whistling sounds. That's exactly what they sound like. And they walk like this and they're just really dorky, but beautiful, beautiful birds. And speaking of beautiful, look at these, look at this red footed booby. This is an adult. Um, yes, their face is this colorful uh, and um, their feet are also very colorful. I'll show you their feet. This is a young, a fledgling booby. Even so, still super colorful bill, eye ring. You can see all the downy fluff and the fresh feathers. So you know that's a youngster. I guess because of the heat and the time of the day, it was like nap time for everyone. We got so many photos of birds sleeping <laughs> on that island. This is a magnificent frigate bird taking a nap. Dryad heron taking a nap. And here's an example of how all these birds nest together. This is a baby frigate bird. It looks like George Washington with all the white, like the white wig. Nazca boobies nesting. And then over here we had, um, it looks like a Nazca booby, red-footed boobies nesting and frigate bird. Just a great example of these, you know, tens of thousands wow. of birds. I know, isn't this beautiful? So this is what the adult red-footed booby looks like. Extraordinary red feet. And this is a young frigate bird. This is a young blue-footed booby. Again, I'm sorry, red-footed booby. Again, no blue, uh, no red feet. I'm getting all the feet mixed up. And then what was interesting was, so this beautiful island, we were on this, we're up high, again, flattened volcano, uh, coastal cliffs, and in the sky, I couldn't really capture it, but there were literally tens of thousands of little birds twirling around and they were all storm petrels. I was told it's the largest storm petrel, four different species 
largest storm petrel colony in the world. There's millions. And so the sky, imagine it's like bats overhead, except it's little seabirds. And I kept seeing pieces of petrels laying around. And I wondered what was preying on them. And then when we came to this spot, I, I found out, and it was this. Um, we saw, my friend captured this, this was the exact owl we saw, a short-eared owl. And we did see him grab a petrel while we were there. But the pickings are, are good. There are a lot of birds out there. And so we have short-eared owls here also. I haven't looked to see if it's the same exact, exact same um, species, but their owl is also, I believe it is, but their owl is also darker to blend in with the habitat there. Okay, and this is the very, very end of my trip. So after we visited uh, that part of Genovisa in the morning, and then you go back and there's usually a talk and there's lunch, and then we went on our afternoon trip and I almost didn't go on it. I was feeling sad that this was my very last day and I knew I would miss it. And um, I'm really glad that I did. This was like my farewell to the Galapagos because we went to Genovese's Darwin's Bay and here we saw a lot of um, swallowtail gulls. Oops. Look at this gull. This is an absolutely beautiful bird. It is the only nocturnal gull in the world. And so you can see it has red around its eyes and that is believed to funnel light into the retina so that they can see better at night. They had a beautiful call. They're a delicate, small bird. They were the one animal that made me cry. I just felt cathartic. When I saw them, I didn't want to leave them. This is a young red-footed booby. Um, these are Genovisa, this is a Genovisa mockingbird, so an endemic mockingbird and a young red-footed booby overhead. And this was um, a, <laughs> a booby colony. It was a nursery of young red-footed boobies and they are very silly. They're waiting for their parents to come back from sea with food and they don't know what they're doing and one of them landed on this girl's head. And she's got to be the most photographed person of that entire trip because even I had like 50 pictures of this booby on her head. Um, and it was just, it was ridiculous. They are truly ridiculous. The sand was incredible. It was mostly fossilized coral. And Galapagos does not allow you, they don't want you to bring a speck of sand in and you don't leave with a speck of sand. So as much as I wanted to take something home for my mom, um, I couldn't, I had to bring her home chocolate instead. <laughs> um, these are the swallowtailed gulls. Just words can't express. They are a painting, a living, breathing painting. Beautiful, beautiful bird. I didn't have time to put a video in here, but they also have a very pretty call. These are just more mamas and babies. Um, and I took this photo and I loved it because never have I truly been to a place where man and man and beast seem to you know, walk side by side and live in harmony. And it wasn't always that way. This is also a sad photo because this was the last day where we had to turn in all our snorkeling gear so that it could be disinfected. <laughs> but I thought it was a beautiful, colorful photo. Okay, so Galapagos. So I called this presentation uh, the untouched lands, or actually I think I called it like come with me to the Galapagos. Um, but Galapagos was not always untouched. Uh, it was discovered by Europeans when the Spanish arrived in 1535. And what happened was because the islands are 600 miles out to sea and shrouded in fog for much of the year, dark islands, uh, they were not thought of as hospitable. And so the Spanish arrived and they left. There wasn't a lot here for them. What really destroyed Galapagos was the whalers in the mid 17th century. You now know how rich the waters are in marine life. So just over harvesting, whaling, but also they introduced domesticated animals. They introduced pigs, um, goats, and this decimated the vegetation 
which is what the tortoises, I mean, there's many animals that consume the vegetation, but the tor tortoises, they are vegetarian and they thrive on it. Uh, so that is really um, that, and then basically slaughtering tortoises for food um, on their whaling boats is what did the, the tortoises in. Uh, fortunately, in 2006, the Ecuadorian government, they removed the last of the goats and the last of the pigs in 2000. And so now their focus is limiting the demands of uh, tour tourism, illegal fishing, invasive species. Um, you can't bring uh, food or anything. We couldn't bring food with us onto the islands. Um, because they don't want to introduce non-native species. And I have to say something that I really appreciated also was everything on that boat was from the Galapagos because they want to keep it native. They want to keep it local and also support the local economy. So all the fruits, they're native to Galapagos. Um, and it was just, it was really, really, they really care about the land and the place. Um, there have been a few oil spills there. In fact, two weeks after I left, there was a 500 gallon spill. I can't remember now. I think it was crude oil and it was contained quickly, thank goodness, or so they say. But right in San Cristobal in the harbor. And I literally, I had been there two weeks before. And so my heart broke just knowing the potential impact there after seeing so much life. Plastics, of course, pose a threat to the marine life and climate change um, has been also a threat. They're finding more intense storms when there are storm systems. Um, and then periods of extreme drought are often followed by periods of excessive rain. And so this disrupts everything, including the marine iguanas who their main food is um, this, see, like a, it's like a, a grass. I can't remember exactly if it's an algae or, um, but it's like a seagrass and that's what they eat. So you can imagine in periods of extreme drought, uh, iguanas die off because they cannot find the food that they need. I love this book. I took this with me and it was inexpensive. I highly recommend, even if you're not going to the Galapagos, it's packed with information. I also love that this book tells you when animals are breeding and the timing. People often ask me like, what is the best time of year to go see the Nazca boobies breeding? Well, it all depends also on the islands because like I said, each island has its own climate um, and has its own landscape. So the birds breed in at different times on different islands. It's really fascinating. And I just want to share when I was on that trip, something I didn't mention was this boat you have National Geographic staff at your beck and call. So I was on board with National Geographic photographers and naturalists, and they spend so much time with you, um, just teaching you about everything. And I absolutely fell in love with Tom Peschak. I highly recommend looking him up on Instagram. He is one of the few actual staff wildlife photographers for National Geographic. His images were extraordinary. And he, um, he, he inspired me, honestly, to get something other than an iPhone to take my photos with. <laughs> He's a really incredible photographer. Oops, sorry about that. These were my other, some other wonderful people who I met on the trip who are very dear to me. Okay, so before we go to questions, I just want to say, I want to say thank you and I also want to say that I am going back to Galapagos this year in October on the very same trip. It won't necessarily be the same islands. Um, the Ecuadorian government dictates that and I don't think we know that yet, but it's the same boat. Um, and I can't wait to go. So I am going to take some questions and then we have Nancy Bradford. She is from Nomadic Travel Company and she booked this trip for me. So she is gonna come on, she's gonna give a, a brief presentation and answer questions. Um, so before, for those of you who may not wish to stay on, um, let's take some questions now. 
Does anyone have questions? You can go ahead and type them into the chat function. I'm going to stop my share because my mouse is rolling. <laughs> Let's see. Any question? Oh, here's a question from Denise. With all those birds, how, bir how bad is the bird poop smell? Interestingly, I did not, I do not remember smelling bird poop. Maybe because we're, it's such an, you know, you're outdoors and not in an enclosed area, but I do not remember smelling anything. I do remember smelling when we were at the sea lion colony with all the pups and the mothers um, in San Cristobal, I remember smelling their poop in that one section. <laughs> the name of the good photographer was Thomas Peschak, P-E-S-H-A-K. Uh, I'm sorry, P-E-S-C-H-A-K. I'm going to write that. There. What one book would you recommend reading prior to this trip? I would recommend, I haven't rec I have not read any um, Galapagos related books other than field guides. So I'm afraid I can't make a great, a great recommendation except this field guide, um, Wildlife of the Galapagos by Julian Fitter, F-I-T-T-E-R. I, I love it. I love it. it. It includes plants, animals, and insects. And so I found it to be very beneficial. What was the route to get there from the Cape and how long did it take you to get there? These are great questions. So from the Cape, um, you fly from Miami. And I actually did a pre-extension where I flew to Quito, um, which is a huge city in Ecuador. And so for this upcoming trip, you can fly, you would fly from Miami probably to Guayaquil. And then from Guayaquil, uh, you take a small local flight on Avianca. And so Miami to Guayaquil, goodness, I can't remember, but it was, it was four hours probably. And then from Guayaquil to the Galapagos Islands was only a couple of hours. So and the great thing is their time zone, they're only one hour behind us. Wow. Wow. So that was, that was really good, especially to communicate with family. Mm -hmm. And when we were on the boat, there were some days where I didn't even try to get on the internet. I mean, we are, we're just in the middle of nowhere, but most of the days I could even use my AT&T I think it's called glo excuse me, Global Pass, where I could get a signal. And then when we were on the island of Santa Cruz, that's their largest population of 11,000 people. And so of course there, you know, it's like everyone's using their phone because, <laughs> because they can. <laughs> so yes, what did you do for carrying water with you during the excursions? Uh, so the excursions, yes, we always carried water on the excursions. Um, I'm trying to think of how we always carried water. You can bring water in your backpacks. They just don't want you to bring food. Unless, of course, you have a medical condition that requires uh, food. And we always have a guide with us. So I want to say the reason I'm struggling with this is because I went on the pre-extension and they gave me this awesome water bottle. So, and then there's always water in your room. So I believe I just kept filling that. Otherwise um, they must have had, uh, I assume plastic water bottles that uh, people would take out with them, if that makes sense. But yes, always we, we would have water. And when you get back to the boat, they always have a fresh native fruit drink ready. Wow. So that, <laughs> yes, so that you can replenish yourself when you get on the boat. And Nancy Bradford, actually, I should have Nancy um, come on right now to help answer these questions. Nancy is our travel specialist. And she says four and a half hours from Miami to Guayaquil and then two hours to the Baltra airport. Nancy, I'm going to make you a co-host so that you can come on. Oops. 
Chairman, I think I made you a co-host by accident also. Uh oh. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Hey, yes. yes. Thank you for that wonderful presentation, Stephanie. That was one awesome, awesome photo. You're so welcome. Thank you for being here. Yeah, I was there the year before and I was lucky enough to swim with the penguins as well. That was really exciting. Mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. You saw seahorses too. Oh, that's right. I did not see seahorses or hammerhead sharks. Those were, I didn't miss those. This time. Looks like you uh, missed a question. Um, Andrea asked, you mentioned being late back to the boat when snorkeling. How do you tell time underwater? <laughs> Um, so I was a, I was bad because you're always with your partner and really your Zodiac driver and your guides are always looking out for you. And so I think my partner was just like, obviously I was, I was within sight. So no one was worried, but then I start seeing people like doing this, <laughs> you know, like hurry up. And I felt bad. I just, oh, if there was, if we could just stay in the water all day, that would be amazing. <laughs> And by the way, you do not have to be in the water. For those of you who don't want to be in the water, they also have kayaks. They had kayaking excursions and they have a glass bottom boat. Um, and they also have, for people who are certified, they have scuba, um, scuba offerings. I'm not certified, so I couldn't do that. But I realize I always talk about water and not everyone wants to be in the water and you don't have to be. Any other questions, Nancy? Yes, they provide all the equipment, yep. Yes, um, Denise, they gave us everything, including you always have a life preserver, um, life preservers that you take back to the room, life preservers on the boat. So you always have everything, it's really great. And somebody did ask last time we had this presentation about uh, special, um masks snorkeling masks for people to wear glasses they have those as well that's so good that they do and that was a great question that i hadn't even thought of um nancy were you going to show a present a presentation yes yes uh, not a, a real presentation but um just where you can find everything if you have more questions um let me share my screen Oh, you have to enable me. Interesting. To share my screen. All right, I will. I made you a co-host. Let me see. I'll make you the host. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay. Just remind me, don't hang up before me <laughs> as the host. <laughs> Can everybody see my screen? Good. Great. Okay. Here's where you can find out more information from the trip. Uh, just go to www.nomadictravelcompany.com and there's a web page and it gives you um, everything you need to know, the dates and so forth and the pricing. A few of the categories are starting to sell out. So heads up on that. Uh, prices are subject to change. Um, they've been pretty stable on prices, but just a note that they are always subject to change. And right now they're offering free airfare from Miami. Um, and if you do your own air, they're also offering a $450 uh, deduction from your trip if you decide to use frequent flyer miles or um, deviate your trip in any way they'll give you a credit uh, to sign up they just need a $750 deposit final payments coming up soon so if you do sign up the next few weeks you can make the choice of either making the deposit or um, I just admitted somebody <laughs> that's okay um, or um you know, pay in, pay in full. And then it's, it's very all inclusive, pretty much everything's included your entrance fees, beverages, all your meals, as Stephanie noted, all the um, equipment, snorkeling, 
you really don't need to bring too much money with you, just, just some pocket money and, and some uh, money for tipping and all that will be in your final documents. We'll probably have a get together or something to go over all the final questions before we go. And then at the bottom, there's the cancellation policies um, and the itinerary gives you more details of what's included, the meals that are included. They always have the right to change the itinerary as Stephanie mentioned uh, too. And I know when I went, our captain, if he saw some interesting, you know, wildlife, one way we, we would turn the boat and head towards it. So they, they're always changing things up to make, make it exciting and, and different. Um, Ecuador does require travel insurance for all US citizens. So there's, um, you can check prices right here on this link and a video. And you can always call me, email me, text me for any information on the trip. And then I did wanna show you a couple things too. Uh, excuse my, my desktop. <laughs> Trying to find, uh, here we go. Oh, let's see, let me stop sharing for a minute. Here we go. Okay, another uh, item I wanted to point out is uh, Lindblad's Cruise with Confidence program. And let me start sharing again. Can everyone see this? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it goes over. Um, I can send this this link to anybody that wants it, but it goes over all their protocols of what they're doing to keep everybody safe. And Lindblad's one of the leaders. They've had many of these protocols already in place, even be <clears throat> excuse me, even before COVID started. <clears throat> but just to point out a few things, they are requiring vaccines for everybody. <clears throat> to go on the cruise. So you, you would need to be vaccinated, but, but that's a good thing. Um, then you know you're in a bubble, a nice safe bubble. And in addition to the vaccines, they're also requiring a couple negative tests when you get down there as well. So, um, you know, they're, they're taking a lot of precautions and you, you can see here, there's just pages, pages and pages of recommendations. And personally, I've been out of the country now seven times in the past few months. And I've been very lucky I haven't gotten sick and I feel it's because I am following all these suggestions that they make on this, um, this uh, link right here, you know, wearing your mask and hand sanitizing and staying in your travel bubble and, and so forth. Then another uh, point I wanted to uh, point out that Lindblad has a good faith plan and more, uh, which means through They've ex they keep extending it, but I can't promise they're gonna extend it now that people are getting vaccinated, uh, but through departures booked through June 30th. If you get cold feet at the last minute, um, at you know, as long as you alert us at least 14 days prior to departure, you can have 100% future travel credit uh, to be used on any future Lindblad trip in 2021 and 2022. So that's, that's a wonderful, wonderful option. Um, you know, if people are a little bit nervous about getting out right now, that, that's a nice plan that they, that they offer. And again, that's only good through June 30th. So I can send you, if anyone would like, email me and I can send you this information. And there was one other thing I wanted to point out. And again, I'm going to have to... Uh, for some reason, it's not letting me move it over, but it's the Mashpee Lodge extension. Um, I can just pull that up here. This year, it's gonna be a, a pre-trip extension. So you would be leaving the Cape on October 17th. And can everybody see this? Yep. 
Okay. Sorry, I'm not very good at these Zooms. Um, but this gives you, again, I can email this to you, but it gives you all the details of the, um, the Mashpee Lodge extension. And the prices for the double occupancy, uh, looks like it's, uh, oh, the writing's so small, 2690. And then they also offer a single occupancy as well. But it gives you the detailed itinerary um, right here in this attachment. And I know Stephanie's going to go and quite a few others as well. So does anyone have any questions for me? Let's see. Nancy asked, have you or Nancy been to the Mashpee extension? <laughs> Um, and yes, I have been. Actually, I'm going to, I don't think people can see me, so I'll make you a co-host so they can see both of us. Sorry, everyone, for the technical stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we can't wait to start meeting in person. <laughs> Let's see. There we go. And then Nancy, I'll make you co-host. Okay, so now you should be able to see both of us. I hope everyone can see me. So I went on the Mashpee Keto extension in 2019, and I was thrilled that they are offering this because it is absolutely incredible. Um, Quito, old Quito is a beautiful historical um, city in Ecuador, and you get to see the city with a guide so you're always with a guide, you're safe. Uh, we went to some of the, the churches there and see some of the markets and where people live. And then we went to the Mashpee Lodge, which was two hours, basically a two hour drive into the Cloud Choco Rainforest. And I, I had never experienced anything like this before. I had never been in a rainforest. And so this place is literally, you're in a National Geographic Lodge. I think it has been rated as like one of the most unique um, and beautiful lodges in the world. So you're in the middle of this forest. There's toucans and toucanets and all these colorful birds, like 12 species of hummingbirds. I didn't want to keep you guys on all night with me, but I, I have like a one minute video <laughs> that I can show um, of this. Mashpee Lodge if you are all interested in seeing it. And then somebody else asked if you can bring your own equipment. Yes, you can. Yes. Yes. And the temperature, Denise asked what the temperature is in October and it's around 77 degrees with lows of 66. So again, very hospitable, good weather. I'm going to try to share my screen. I hope this works. And thank you all for staying on. This is awesome. Okay, can you see this, Nancy? Yes. I guess I should go full screen and then I should go full sound. Okay. Oh, it's two and a half minutes.
for some reason it was a little bit blurry. I hope you could all see it. Um, it's a it's a spectacular place. I did not see it looked that looked like some kind of ocelot or something. I did not see that, but I did. We did see the Terra, which was that um, Fisher-like creature. We saw a Guti. Um, they, it's various different hikes, and so we would hike up to these areas where they're putting out uh, bananas and papaya for these animals to come. And so you can see them closer than you normally would. There's also a lot of beautiful moths, plants, and the food was incredible. And when I was there, it was pre Galapagos trip. And I remember saying like, we don't need to go to the Galapagos because we can just stay here. <laughs> Why do we have to go to the Galapagos? And then of course I learned that the Galapagos leg of the trip was equally as spectacular, but cannot wait to go back to the lodge. It is so special. And if you want to see cock of the rock, um, which is a, a very bizarre type of bird, there is a trip at, from Mashpee Lodge. You have to get up at like 3 a.m. and hike for two hours and they take you up to see these birds. So I am definitely doing that. Um, and then those little um, sky bike across the canopy in the rainforest. That's incredible. And you don't have to do these things. Again, they're all op optional and there's a little bit for everyone. So yeah, so I think that that is all. Does anyone else have any questions? Thanks for everyone for sticking around so long. Thank you. <laughs> I have a one quick question. So what changed that made it possible to have the Mashpee extension on again since it was off for a while? I know. I guess they just were feeling better about it. Um, they're starting up in just a few weeks. And, um, you know, I'm not sure what happened with, within management, but but they're feeling that they can keep everybody in, in a bubble there as well. And I can't promise they won't change it again. <laughs> But uh, right, you know, right now it is, they are allowing us to, to offer it. But, we know, all learn that we can't predict the future. We can't, but it, it, it does look like it's getting better. And, um, you know, I had, I've, I've been fully vaccinated now. So, um, you know, it's moving along quickly. Yeah. It's definitely getting better by the day. Yeah. Will our local guides and staff be vaccinated as well? They should be. I sent out an article. Um, I'll make a note to send it to you. I thought I sent it to you, but I'll send it um, again about the shipments of vaccine that they were sending to the Galapagos. And I would think they're all going to be vaccinated by then with that much vaccine going down there but I will make a note to send that out. It was a really interesting article. And I will send, um, I'll send everyone the link to the itinerary and also the video that I just showed was blurry. I don't know why that is. So I'll just send you the link so you can watch it at your own convenience. Oh, thank you. I'm getting wonderful messages. Thank you, Elisa. <laughs> I'm glad that people enjoyed this. And again, thank you for, for holding on. Any last questions before we sign out? I hope you guys come. It's going to be a blast and so much great food. Amazing animals and great food. And yes, I'm leaving wild care for like 15 days, but they'll be fine. <laughs> oh. oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Whitney. The mice. <laughs> Thanks, Abe. Yes, and leaving mice behind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone. I'll sign off. Thanks for your nice messages. Bye, Nancy. Thanks for being here. Thank you. We'll see Thanks. you soon. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Allison. Bye, Nancy. Bye, Stephanie. Bye. Bye, Allison. Bye. Bye. See you soon, hopefully. Yes, yay, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of months, maybe. We'll probably think we're coming up in June. Oh my goodness, I can't wait. You have to sit on my deck. 
my nature deck. I know I'm, I'm, I'm living vicariously. Well, all your videos, I'm enjoying those. That's so cool with your birds and your, your squirrels and your chipmunks. And can you, can you put one in with the mice or have you already done that? And I missed it. <laughs> I haven't yet, but um, I do have, I have the camera on this mouse family right now. Okay. So, <laughs> so excuse me, if I can get some activity there, I could I could show it. Poor thing, yeah. she hasn't been. I haven't seen any motion on the camera and it's probably because I'm right here talking, but I'm sure as soon as it's quiet that she'll 